there are some things that I feel you need to know. While I spent 35 years as a teacher, a great deal of my teaching existed through my hands, directing choirs and bands, not as a lecturer. And while I've worn many hats in the church over the years, in honesty, I have only stood before a congregation on a Sunday morning to preach once before. And that was about 35 years ago. And I was not asked again. <laughs> I thought it only fair to divulge that publicly this morning before I begin. Well, anyway, a couple more things. All through school, if I had a, a writing assignment, say 10 pages, for instance, I'd work on it and I may go to the school and ask a classmate how many pages they got. And they'd answer, oh man, I got 14 pages, man, I gotta go home and cut a few. And they may return the question to me and I'd answer quietly that I'd gotten five and would be going home to see if I could figure out how to say the same things in three new and interesting ways and to write a really long introduction. There will be repetition today, but when I think it's important. In addition, I have written uh, my message out completely and will be reading quite a bit of the time, but this is to your advantage. Uh, many of you have had conversations with me and realized that no matter the, the brilliance of the thoughts in my head, <laughs> by the time they come out my mouth, they are, can, well, be, uh, they, uh, just there. <laughs> Hence the directing career when I could communicate with my hands and a stick. One last thing, Gloria and I have always been impressed with the number of people here at Gateway that take notes, meaning they desire to remember and ruminate over things and that the sermons here generally have substance enough that gives them pause to write things down. So if you would find occasion to once in a while bow your head and scribble just a, a bit of that, um, that would be a great encouragement to me this morning. <laughs> Actually, as I look through my message this morning, there's very little, if anything, that you do not know or perhaps understand very well, and we'll be able to save some ink today, but we have good news, and it is good to repeat it and to reflect on it and to think of it often, and so let it direct every part of our lives. So let's take a moment to pray before we finally get started. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you desire our prayers. And this morning we ask that our hearts and minds would be fully open to your word and that my words would be faithful to your word. We ask that you would give us, Lord, an ever-increasing love for you, for your word, for those around us in need and who need you. Help us to be light in whatever way you call us to be here in Cleveland. But also give us a heart for the world. Keep us from apathy. We pray for a desire to obey you with humble and servant hearts. We pray for the team that has been ministering in West Virginia this weekend. We pray, Lord, that their work would be fruitful in that community. We pray for the Olympics, for those serving in Paris at the Olympics, that, that you would provide opportunities to share the gospel among the people there. Uh, today, I, I just pray for the Yazidi population of Kurdistan of northern Iraq. We pray that there would be those that you would send to spread your love and light to these people. These highly restrictive people people would be open to hearing your gospel and that your love would be spread amongst this population. And now, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to rest in the good news of the gospel as we continue to worship together. Amen. I've been tasked with Romans 8, verses 18 to 30. Romans 8, considered by many to be perhaps one of the more, very most important chapters in the Bible. There's no pressure there. But I believe that that to be a dangerous and perhaps very irresponsible statement to make, considering the vast truth that we find throughout God's Word. 
However, I will say that this portion is filled with good news. Extremely good news. It doesn't get much better. So let's read together. In my Bible, this portion of text is titled, Future Glory. That's a great start. But now as it's coming here, we invite you to follow along in whatever way you'd like. You should find a Bible in the chair rack in front of you. It should be in the screen behind me. And of course, we have many other methods that you can use as well. But let's read. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in, to us. For the creation waits with eager longing the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So as you look into the text, we find that the word hope occurs several times. And I, I think if we're honest, we would have to admit that we often use that word in our daily language as well. I hope for this or that, or, or we're hoping for whatever. And so I ask you this morning, what are you hoping for? Now, in the classroom, I would instruct you to raise your hand, and I would call on you, elicit some answers from you. But I don't think that's allowed in sermon world, and so I will just make some rather uneducated guesses. Uh, perhaps you're hoping for a more amiable and uh, wise boss who actually knows how to motivate and run a team. Or maybe you're hoping for a raise or, or a different job altogether. Maybe you just hope the car is going to make it another year while you save some more money to get a newer one. Maybe you're just hoping your aches and pains would ease up or for improving health. Maybe you're hoping for Chinese food for lunch. You may be hoping for better family relationships or, or, or that your husband would actually love you as Christ loved the church. Maybe you're just hoping that I'd get on with it this morning. None of these things that, that we may be hoping for can be assured of coming true. How often do we hope for things, even little things, and have our hopes dashed? A lot of our hoping does not materialize as we would like. Even though many things we hope for, we, we can act upon or have influence over, still nothing is ever certain. But how about this hope we find in our text today? This hope is our good news. This isn't a hope that's dependent on effort or circumstances or luck or wealth or might or birth. This hope in our text is assured. There is no wavering. The good news is that this hope in our text is certain and it can most certainly be counted upon. We are a messed up, sinful people. You might have noticed. But God, however, has a plan to get us out of that mess and into eternity with him. So we look at verse 18, the first verse of this text, we find sort of a, a good news, bad news kind of a statement. Good news is that for believers, we have a future glorification that is certain. 
It is promised by our God, who we find throughout the Bible to be fully reliable. God keeps his promises. Now, I read a definition of the word glorification, and, and it speaks of being transformed from being ordinary or unexceptional. And uh, see, that really kind of does describe us in our state, but actually, we're much worse state. Sinful, rebellious, lost, but that just makes this glorification just more amazing, and you can just see what a miraculous transformation that would be. The bad news is that it seems that our trials and sufferings are not necessarily going anywhere this side of heaven. Now, we see often in the Bible of Christians that suffered persecution because they were Christ followers. Saints who suffered torture, beatings, stoned to death. And today as well, there is unspeakable persecution in various parts of our world. Now, you might be able to have a conversation with uh, someone here in this church who may have experienced some, maybe some discrimination or, or may have been excluded from something or, or maybe ridiculed because of faith in Christ. But I would say that that being said, if we start to compare experiences as Christians here in Cleveland, we would have to admit that we have it pretty easy compared to so many faithful followers in so many other parts of the world. Persecution has always been a part of our lives on this earth and will continue to be. But I believe our scripture points to more here. Our lives, at least how we perceive them, are not perfect. It seems that while the good news of our future glorification is perfect, a promise, there doesn't seem to be any promise of a life here on earth that is perfect or anything close to it. There's no promise of that perfect boss, the new car, enough money, I don't know how much that is anyway. An absence of medical problems, freedom from aches and pains. Some of us are aging. No, we are all aging. And sometimes, in fact, oftentimes it can be problematic and painful. There's depression, migraines, allergies, cancer, accidents of various kinds, weight gain, weight loss. Why was my home Wi-Fi not working for five days? Why does cilantro taste like soap? Uh, let's face it, we have some pretty high expectations of what we think our lives should be like. But and nowhere in the Bible does it promise freedom from what we call suffering in our lives. There are many good promises, incredible promises in the Bible. God will never leave us or forsake us. He will always love us. Uh, he will provide peace. His mercies are new every morning. He's our shepherd. His goodness faileth never. We lack nothing if we belong to him, and he is ours forever. And that's just the beginning. We could go on and on. The Bible is filled with good news, like our passage this morning. But now with regards to suffering, and now to complicate matters, it seems that the world around us is no better off. It seems that as a result of the fall of man, our earth was subjected to futility as well. We live in a broken world, and it shouldn't take us long to look around and, and look in the news to see that we are not looking at the Garden of Eden here. And now, don't get me wrong, we have an incredibly beautiful, amazing world, and we can see the evidence of God's master hand in creation wherever we turn. But we can easily see that as we groan, that our earth is also groaning. The South just experienced Hurricane Barrel. There's drought, earthquakes, tornadoes, flooding, pandemics, avalanches, volcanoes, pollution, heat, cold, humidity, dry air. And just don't get me started on midges and mosquitoes and potholes in Cleveland. The world does not exist as originally intended in the Garden of Eden. And this doesn't begin to touch the list of things that just don't quite go the way we think they should. Cleveland is okay, but let's not make any comparisons to the Garden of Eden. This is not our future perfect home. Although there would be many from other parts of the world that would perhaps think it is, compared to their own lives and situations, we have it very good. And we should not take it for granted, and we should be thankful. 35 years ago, we asked a man in China what he thought the U.S. was like. 
And he said that our streets were paved with gold and there was a criminal on every street corner. I told him that was pretty accurate. <laughs> and today, while I'm sure that same man may change the first part of that statement in, in light of the wealth of uh, increasing wealth of China's improved economy, the last half about the criminals on every corner would probably remain the same. We live in a broken world. My mother spent the last three years or better in bed. She was unable to be up in a chair or otherwise spend any time in any other position. She had Lewy body dementia and more than once would turn to me and ask, why doesn't God heal me? Why do these bad things happen? And I would have to tell her that we live in a broken world. And as believers, we are not promised a pain-free, easy life. But we do have new bodies and a sinless life to look forward to. Our bodies are decaying as we sit here in these overly comfortable chairs. But we have good news. It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. As we think about our present suffering, the comparison makes our promised glorification look more amazing than we can ever imagine. We look ahead to our new bodies, and our new adopted bodies, a freedom from aches and pains and diseases and disappointments and stress, and we could go on and on listing any number of things we'd like different in our lives. But let's continue for more good news. Let's look to Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away. I don't know why I cry every time I read this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. The present sufferings of this time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The glory to come is so far beyond our present struggles. In the meantime, though, what do we do with our present sufferings? Maybe all we can say is that our problems on this earth and our frustration should drive us to greater dependence on the Lord, to trust in Him for direction, for peace. As believers, the Holy Spirit is within us to comfort and guide us. And, and let's look at Paul here, who wrote Romans. He didn't have it easy. Beatings kept on preaching, imprisonment, kept on singing, stoning, kept on getting up, complained to God about the thorn of his side, some sort of ailment, got no answer. And he's writing to believers in Rome who are already experiencing persecution. And if the dates of the writing of, of the book of Romans are indeed close to being accurate, they soon would have Emperor Nero to deal with as well. Now, it doesn't diminish what you, are maybe, you and I may be dealing with at this very moment. But take comfort that our future glory will so far, far outweigh our present problems. Our time here on earth is very short in light of eternity. This is not our home. There will be that day when all things will be made right. The creation which our text says groans with the pains of childbirth birth, and we ourselves groan Wait for the redemption of our bodies. There is hope, an assured hope. It is certain. It is hope that is in completion. Now, as I think about this time of struggles and trials, and I read this verse, a vision of a turtle comes to mind. Have you ever seen a turtle that is stretching its neck so far out to reach for something? It seems that it's straining so hard that it seems it's trying to escape its home. The way it stretches out its neck as if it can't wait to free itself from the bondage of the shell which it slows it down. 
that shell which perhaps is representative of our present suffering. Yes, I know. For those of you who are saying it's a protective shell and it keeps the turtle safe, you just get out of my vision for a while. It's my vision. But we, so we hope of escape from this broken world and our broken bodies and the suffering of this short and temporary life. Now in verse 25, it says we wait with patience. And we've just said that suffering is and will be in our lives until that day of our full adoption. So the word patience gives us pause. For some of us, patience may not be our strongest suit. Anybody? Not everyone has had the advantage of having taught middle school for 35 years, which tends to build that trait in a person. But even for the retired middle school teacher, this still sounds like a very tall order. But again, it's in this perfect hope that we can look forward to the future glory. We strain and we reach forward. First Philippians 3.13, talking about the, the righteousness from Christ, Paul writes, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Or Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is before us. In fact, as I studied this portion of Romans, there was good evidence that perhaps a better word instead of patience might be the word endurance. We wait for it with endurance. Okay, so what does that look like? We keep running the race. We, we seek God's will for our lives. We're obedient to his word. We take seriously the Great Commission. We love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourselves, and give thanks in all things. We keep doing what God's word tells us to do. For Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this, the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay, a couple things here. Again, the problems and sufferings in our lives draw us to close reliance and relationship with God. We are a proud and stiff-necked people, but let's be honest, when things are going well, or at least we perceive that things are going well, we start to drift back in our own pride and try taking charge of our own lives, and we forget that God has the perfect plan for our lives. Suffering brings us back to greater reliance and trust in him. And do we also not desire that our lives be a witness to God's love to non-believers around us? The world around us should see this incredible hope that is in us that comes by the presence of the Holy Spirit. How do we handle suffering in our lives? What does it look like? Does it point to the gospel? More good news. We know that as we come to faith, the Holy Spirit enters the believer. We read that in verse 23. We as believers have the first fruits of the Spirit. And now in verse 26, it says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Our weakness. Do we even know how or what to pray? Verse 26 indicates, no, not so much. This is part of our weakness. It says we do not pray as we ought. So, should we bother to pray? Yes, God invites us to pray. We just read that we should pray without ceasing. He desires us to pray. To praise, to thank, to confess our sin, to make supplication. In our prayers, we grow closer in our walk with him. He delights in our prayers and our thanks, feeble as they are. And in our supplication, sometimes this is more difficult. We don't always know what to pray for. We think we know what to pray for, but too often we can get pretty selfish in our prayers. This is the good news here. It says the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. These groanings, which would be unintelligible to us, would certainly be done to God, who is one with the Spirit. And so these groanings are uttered in accordance to the will of God for us. God understands the groanings and answers them because they are uttered in accordance with his perfect will for us. That's, that's incredible, isn't it? We have an advocate. The Spirit knows our needs and prays according to the will of God 
in our weakness, in our pride and sinful nature, we don't always know what to pray for. The spirit within us does. We move on to verse 28, which says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Some manuscripts say God works all things together for good. Another says God works in all things for the good. And now we could take a bunch of time and try and wrestle the differences. But I think in the end, they all point to the fact that God has a plan. And basically, what we're saying here is that there isn't anything that will interfere with God's purposes. He will use all things in our lives to bring us to the eventual redemption of our bodies. And we, we might like to get specific here in, verse, in this verse. We like to point to things in our lives, especially those things under that suffering category, and say, well, they make me stronger, uh, that they make me more reliant on God. Uh, this is preparing me for something in the future, or maybe for handling further trials. Maybe to help others going through similar things in their lives. And these things may very well be true, and this is a good way of looking at these things. I think what Paul says here is that God is working for the ultimate good, and that good is his glory. He will bring us to our final redemption for his glory. Our completed adoption as children of God and the ultimate purpose here is to bring God glory. The purpose is about God. And we can just be thankful that he uses all things in our lives to that end, to bring glory to himself. Now we've been using the word adoption because we use this term when we first believe and trust in what Christ did for us in his death and resurrection. As we first believe in faith, the Bible says, we become children of God. But we also use it here in our final redemption upon Christ's return. Upon Christ's return, we have our final adoption where we will be like Christ, brothers in Christ. Not deity, of course, not God's, but, but let's say uh, morality. We will be sinless. What a day that will be when we don't have to deal with sin or the temptation. And we'll have new bodies that do not decay or suffer. We will have our final adoption. We will be able to worship and praise God as he finally, finally as he deserves. Now we come to a section that most, if not all, are familiar with, and some of you are wondering if I have left enough time this morning to cover completely. The section, I suppose, could supply enough for an entire sermon in and of itself, but that's not happening this morning because I don't want to distract from what I feel Paul's purpose is here. It seems that this section is here is our final proof that for believers, our salvation is complete, our future glorification. It's done. This is the hope we're talking about. This hope, again, that is not wishful thinking, a hope that is assured. It is not yet seen, as it says, for who hopes for something that is seen, nor we can say that it is fulfilled. So what is this proof? All right, first, we come by the word foreknowledge. God knows us. The Bible says he knew us before we were even knit together in our mother's womb. Psalm 139. There is nothing about us he does not know. The plan is in existence. It says we are predestined. Destined for what? What is our destination? It is the final adoption, the redemption of our bodies. This is his plan. And it says he called us. He desires us to be his. He has called us to be his own so we can believe and trust in faith in what Christ has done for us. Those he called, justified. Justification, total righteousness in God's sight. We are clothed in righteousness, fit to be in God's presence, sins forgiven. Nothing imperfect can enter God's presence and we can't do it ourselves. We need to be justified before we could come before God in judgment and then experience final glorification. In verse 30, we see the word is glorified, past tense. This is the exclamation point on the fact that we can be assured in this final step. What God will do can be relied on to such an extent that it can be spoken of as already having happened. This is the good news. It's done. We can count on it. 
No more wishful thinking. There's nothing any of us can do to earn this. It's complete. This is God's plan for you. It is God's plan for me. How do we get to this point? Okay, I have to hit some of my favorite verses. You're stuck with me this morning. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. And many like to just stop there, but 10 is too important. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we repent of sin in our lives and believe then and trust in the cleansing blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin. We die to self and turn our lives over to Christ. And we can say we have been saved by grace, totally free gift, through faith. But that isn't even our own. Our faith is a gift from God. There is nothing we can do to add to it. No good works, not like every other faith system, which depends on hoping they have done enough to earn their reward. Hoping their good outweighs the bad. That is wishful thinking hope. That is not the secure, certain hope, the already complete hope we have in Christ. All right, so what? Years ago, Gloria and I led the high school class on Sunday mornings in our former church for a while, and I had what could easily be argued as a bad idea. It was that thought that after we had spent some time in the Bible or on a topic concerning our faith that I would ask the question, so what? which sounds negative and disrespectful, but what I wanted them to answer is, so what now? What are we to do with this knowledge or portion of Scripture? I want an application, if you will. So this morning, we ask, how does this knowledge, this truth, this assurance affect us? How do we approach the rest of today or month or the year with the knowledge that we can be assured of eternity in the new heaven and the new earth with God himself on the throne? Do we love God and love ourselves enough that we would love, that that love would spill to those around us who are struggling and suffering? Do we love enough to care for those around us who don't yet know the love of God? Do we see our day through the eyes of God? Do we do our best each day to honor ourselves or to honor God? Do we use the gifts and talents God has given us to honor ourselves or to honor Him? Do we spend time in God's word and in prayer? Do we desire to be more and more like him? Do we desire that every part of our lives be honoring to God? The purpose here is God's glory. The good news should shape every part of our lives. Our response to this good news is that our desire should be that we should be more like Christ. God says, God's word says we are to be like him. First Peter says we are to called to be holy. Now that holiness will not, of course, be complete until our final adoption. But in the meantime, he has prepared work for us to do, work that would glorify him. This time on our earth here is a time of sanctification, a time of becoming more Christ-like. Now there are some who feel that Paul doesn't mention the word sanctification in this passage because the other terms, foreknowledge, called, Justified, glorified are all things he has done and nothing from ourselves. But sanctification is something we are expected to put some effort into. We are called to be Christ-like. Christ suffered, and by sharing in the sufferings of Christ, that is based on having the mind of Christ, the believer is gradually being made into his likeness. Sanctification. We should desire to be Christ-like. I'm going to end with a a quote from C.S. Lewis. I like C.S. Lewis. He's he's not perfect, but I just like the way he says things. And in this little quote, he's speaking of the Lord's Prayer. It's very, this is what he says, its very first words are, Our Father. Do you now see what these words mean? They mean, quite frankly, that you are putting yourself in the place of a son of God. To put it bluntly, you are dressing up as Christ. If you like, you are pretending because, of course, the moment you realize what the words mean, you realize that you are not a son of God. 
You are not being like the Son of God, whose will and interests are at one with those of the Father. You are a bundle of self-centered fears, hopes, greeds, jealousies, and self-conceit, all doomed to death. So in that way, in a way, this dressing up as Christ is a piece of outrageous cheek. But the odd thing is that he has ordered us to do it. We wait during our present sufferings. We seek to be more like Christ and give thanks for the hope of the glorification of the final redemption to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your plan for us, your plan for our lives. Yes, here for this short time on this broken earth, but so much more for your plan to rescue us from our broken selves, the plan to glorify us for the purpose of bringing glory to you. Amen.